Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free trial at www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co slash PMC. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. Next up on our event schedule is the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual on December 6th through 8th, 2022. On day one of the event, we'll be hosting the first ever Stock Pitch World Cup. Six global areas, six moderators, 24 total stock pitches. Joining us to moderate each special session is Maj Don representing the USA, Paul Andriola representing Canada, Fadi Diab representing Australia, Jason Hirschman representing Europe, and Kelvin Sito representing Asia. The only way to see the Stock Pitch World Cup, as well as the entire event, is by registering now. And then also on day two and three will be presentations from microcap management teams, as well as one-on-one meeting opportunities. Attendance for both events is complimentary by both. I mean, the virtual as well as our upcoming event in Vegas. And registration is now open for our virtual events. So to join us, please visit www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. Now for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Fadi Diop at the Gladiator HC on Twitter and Billy Duberstein from Stone Oak Capital. We recently published the Q3 2022 issue of the Planet Microcap Review magazine, which is now available on Scribd issue, which is spelled I-S-S-U-U, script is spelled S-C-R-I-B-D, and on Substack. The theme for this issue is, is it time to look for fallen angel stocks? According to the Planet Microcap Index from January 2022 to the end of Q3, microcaps are down 34.74%, not too far off from all the major indices. Almost every microcap company you look at is down at least 30 to 50% on average. As my friend and colleague, though, likes to say, uh, Rick Rule, he loves to remind me that bear markets are the authors of bull markets. Thus, I sought after a few authors to help me answer if now is the time to look at some of the most beaten up names out there. Special thank you goes out to Ben Claremont and Tim Travis, who, although couldn't join our chat today, also contributed great pieces discussing fallen angels as well. Fadi and Billy jumped on to talk more about Fallen Angels, what that phrase means to them, and more. My favorite part of our conversation today that I think you should all pay attention to is when we discuss how to determine whether a particular stock that's down 30, 40, 50, 80% is deserved because you know it's just a dog, or whether it's a quality business whose valuation is more of an overreaction. I thought Billy and Fadi made some excellent points and suggestions here on what they look for. Thank you again for tuning into episode 248 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Fadi Diab and Billy Duberstein. This episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense. You can find them at streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co backslash PMC. Stream is an expert interview transcript library that is starting to become an integral part to investors' research process. They have a number of interviews on a wide variety of companies, including TMT, consumers, industrials, real estate, and more. Stream provides over 300 expert interviews per week, and 70% of their experts are found exclusively on Stream. 
Stream is unlike any other transcript libraries. Stream integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Stream's community of experts and thought leaders partner with Stream to build their professional brands and expand their industry influence. Right now, there are approximately 8,500 plus call transcripts available. For more information, please visit www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co backslash PMC. Billy, Fadi, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Well, well, thanks for having me, Robert. Awesome. It's great to have you both on here. And let me just start off by saying thank you guys so much for contributing to this this theme that I, I wanted to have for Q3 2022. I mean, it ended up being quite timely, um, you know, unfortunately, and and maybe fortunately, um, you know, just in micro caps in particular, I said this in the editorial, you know, uh, year to date at the end of Q3, you know, according to our index, Planet Microcap Index, uh, microcaps are down 34.74%. You know, all the other indices not faring much better. Um, so it's kind of quite timely to really start evaluating, okay, what are what are some quality out there that are now, you know, their valuations have been cut, you know, 30, 40, sometimes 50 to 80% um, in many respects. So uh, I asked, I asked you guys to contribute articles uh, also uh, who contributed articles, but couldn't join us here today was Ben Claremont from Coast Street Capital, as well as Tim Travis from TNT Capital Management. Uh, their articles also fantastic. I highly recommend you go and check out what they had to write on there. But uh, we got Billy and Fadi here today. So, you know, let, let's start off with the, the one of the questions I asked both of you to answer for this article was this I was trying to define fallen angels. And the fun part of why I wanted to have multiple people contribute to this theme is that this definition can kind of vary really from from anybody, depending on what your focus is or where, you know, what type of companies you really look for. So let, let's kind of start there. So, uh, Billy, you want to start us off with how you define fallen angels? Yeah, sure. Great. Um, when I think of the term fallen angels, I uh, to me, it seems uh, a really high quality company that had a lot of hype around it and really has a lot going for it but perhaps got way ahead of itself uh, or the stock got way ahead of itself. And uh, when you have a high growth company and suddenly either the macro circumstances or the company runs into a hiccup and growth decelerates, and especially when you get interest rates rising now and you potentially get the economy going into a downturn, you can get a really enormous re-rating. Uh, the prime example I always think about is obviously Amazon during the dot-com bust, which fell, I believe, 90% uh, between 2000 and 2002. Um, obviously, if you had, there were a lot of dot-com hyped up companies that weren't for real and never made it back to their prior highs or they went bankrupt. But out of all of the companies that kind of got thrown out, you also have an Amazon, a, a gem among, um, uh, you know, the various tech companies that blew up during that time. So I think uh, at Amazon at its uh, 2002 low traded at a split adjusted price of 30 cents. Stock's about 120 now. So if you had gone in during that period, you would have made out quite well. So, uh Obviously, Amazon had a tremendous amount going for it prior to that, but uh, maybe the stock got ahead of itself. You have the tech bubble bursting, liquidity drying up, uh, economy going into the downturn after 9-11. Um, and, uh, you know, the stock obviously re-rated a huge amount. And uh, But for if you'd invested during that time, you would probably be retired and on a beach in Fiji right now. And uh, I now is the time to be looking for those types of opportunities today. Very cool, Fadi. Love to. Let's let's hear your definition. Yeah, I have a, I have a similar definition. Um, to me, there's really two main things that moves uh, a stock in the micro cap space. You know, one is obviously the performance of the company and management and directors, and secondly um, is money flow. So money flow is incredibly important. You know, you, I've come across a lot of stocks that are performing really well, but are in sectors that the market just doesn't really care about at that point in time. 
and they perform a lot less than companies who aren't achieving the same sorts of goals, but are in sectors that the, that the market um, finds hot at that time or has been hot for quite a while. And so when it comes to fallen angels uh, in the micro cap space, you really only have two types of companies. Either you're a new IPO, um, which started off with a small valuation, or you're a fallen angel. So you've been a company that had you know huge plans, you had big dreams, um, didn't get achieved. And over time, sometimes just over you know a decade, you just see a gradual fall in share price until you know the company is pretty much uh, needs a new, uh, a new strategy or uh, a new direction, probably a new management team, and you're pretty much just starting again. Uh, you know, or maybe a five, ten, fifteen million dollar valuation, and so you see these companies go from some, sometimes a billion plus um, down to about five or ten million market cap, and you know, there's no coming back from that. From my perspective, you might you have the the odd one in probably a hundred thousand Amazon stock, or you know, very very successful companies that you know have gone down ninety plus percent and have recovered, but the vast vast majority never ever do. The only way they recover is when you have new people come on board with a new business or a new strategy, and it's pretty much a new company, and you start again. So, uh, and money flow plays a, a very big part in that because if you know a, a lot of these companies that the fundamentals weren't really there in the first place can look like market darlings in bull markets like 2020, 2021, and then when the market realizes actually you know th their long term prospects aren't that good, that money just exit the stock, and you know unless that sector goes through another bull market, then it, it'll just stay at those really low valuations until they the the, sec, the, the market changes or the, the, you know they find a new strategy or a new business. For sure. I, it, you know, what's funny is that it, it's like, if for you, it's not necessarily the fallen angels. It's more just like they're perpetual uh, turn potential turnarounds, <laughs> right? Like, Correct. That's <laughs> all, that's my, my main strategy is to find these turnarounds. When you've got companies that have shareholders who are so disgruntled, that they're they're willing to sell their stock at a, a very very low valuation, where I can see a company turning around. I don't have ten years of heartbreak, you know, of the of management not delivering and just constantly seeing my portfolio, you know, go down in value. So you can buy these stocks for very very low valuations of people who have just had enough, and you know, I feel for them. But it's an opportunity for people who can see, you know, twelve, twenty months, thirty six months down the track. To say if this turns around and the market plays plays ball and the sector you know heats up, then you can see a tremendous amount of growth and share price appreciation in a pretty short amount of time. Absolutely, Billy, feel free to jump in at any time. You know, do, I mean, you guys both heard each other's definitions and how you approach all this stuff. You know, what do you think about each other's you know thoughts here and strategy on that? So, Billy, let's go to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's really two sides of the same coin because um, uh, a really high quality company probably isn't going to go down 80% or 90% unless it is running into some sort of headwinds that management is trying to, and it probably won't recover unless management fixes it. Or um, the, co the company just runs into a severe headwind that's going to um, affect its performance uh, for the next year or two. Um, many money managers have very short uh, time horizons when they're worried about near-term performance. But again, as Fadi said, if, if you can look 12, 18, 24, 36 months in the future um, and you don't have the baggage of having bought at a high price, uh, you know, really, and, and since the market's forward-looking, on the first signs of a turnaround, um, you can get a lot of appreciation in a short amount of time. Or you can get into a holding that you that can turn into a long-term holding that you can hold for 10, 20 years and um, can potentially become a hundred bagger um, as in that, uh, that famous investing book. So, uh, you know, high quality that's been marked down. Usually it's going through some sort of turnaround or difficulty it's dealing with. And uh, you just got to try to take advantage of the myopia of uh, short-term oriented uh, investors or investors who just, can't take the pain anymore <laughs> for sure why did you want to jump in there yeah and, and i think the distinction between high quality and not high quality is important because you only see a quality stock you know generating a profit 
um, continually increasing revenues, decreasing costs, go down by 90%. Uh, the, the Amazon example was in one of the biggest booms in history. So you can't really, that's, that wasn't a normal market environment. But, you know, I, I recently ran um, my own screen up, screening process through about 600 stocks on the ASX or micro caps. And the, the vast majority were down between 50 and 80% mm-hmm. this year. Okay, so I, I wanted to run that exercise throughout the year to see how they were coping with the, you know, the market correction, and the vast majority were down um, fifty to eighty percent. One one correlation I found though is companies that performed better, so were down say twenty to thirty percent, all had um, management holding a significant amount of stock that they purchased on market. So these were much higher quality. Management were buying on market. They they put their money where their mouth is. They understand the long term potential, and so those higher quality stocks, I agree, wouldn't go down fifty to eighty percent. I would classify the second bucket, the the lower quality ones that were down fifty to eighty percent, as the fallen angels, because you know if we're using fallen angel, you know Satan never rises back up into heaven. The fallen angels generally stay as fallen angels, and that that they need a complete transformation, normally years and years down the track. Um, and it's a brand new company. So it's not like the angel itself is resurrecting or, or it's transforming. It needs to change most of the time. We're, we're about to get into a religious conversation. <laughs> how we you all define it. Bull no, 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 I love it. I, no, 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 I appreciate that because, and I'm, and I'm glad you brought up this point because that's something that I think we really want to dig into in terms of a, a rabbit hole here. Because, you know, I was just on a very, uh, I was looking at a conference list not that long ago where I was looking at the list of microcaps and, Every, almost every single one was down at over 50% year to date. Easy, you know, uh, fit, fit, sometimes even more. Um, and I have to ask myself, you know, not all of these are dogs, right? They, they can't all possibly be dogs. I mean, don't get me wrong. Maybe the majority are. I'm not totally sure. You know, I'm, you know, I leave people who are much smarter than me to, uh, to make that call one way or the other. But there, but there's clearly some value that folks have seen in these businesses at some stage of its life or potentially in the future, right? So our real task is trying to figure out, okay, of those ones that are down year to day, 50 to 80%, what uh, other than, you know, maybe just seeing some management buybacks, you know, what about some of these businesses can we pinpoint as saying, okay, these have some qualities that might lend itself to being a good turnaround potentially. And, or, you know, look, that actually is probably a quality business. They're just being beaten down because the rest of its sector is just getting absolutely killed as well. So for you guys in your vast experience and looking at some of these things, you know, what would you say are some of the things that folks can look to, to say, all right, these can't all be bad. What are, what are some of the signs that, you know, maybe this might, you know, maybe, maybe this is just a little bit of an overreaction. So uh, who wants to take that one first? Billy, you want to, want to go first? Sure. Um, what are some of the things you can look at? Um, I do think um, the, the stock I'll be pitching is a founder-led business. Uh, and the CEO, uh, as Fatty uh, alluded to, inside ownership, he owns 15% of the economics of the business. He has uh, 77% voting rights. Um, the company just has a history of strong revenue growth and execution. Um, you know, in the... the <laughs> You don't want to dismiss a company because its financials are ugly this year because there's that could be the reason that's down. It, you want to understand if it's a deterioration of the business or if it's a one-time hit. Uh, there's a lot of interest rate, currency. Um, if you do business in Russia or China, uh, these kind of one-off factors that are, might have uh, caused a year-over-year um revenues or earnings to be ugly. Um, you probably don't want a company who uh, that is losing a lot of money structurally. That's different from losing money today, but you want to um, try to dig into like, what's the contribution margin of the business? Um, can it be profitable if it scales? Um uh, how much are they paying out in stock-based compensation? Because a lot of uh, former darlings uh, still pay way too much stock-based compensation that dilute shareholders. Um, and you also want to look 
to see um, balance sheet. Can it make it through a recession? Uh, and even if it's losing money on a gap basis, what's, it, what's its cash burn? Um, cause you're probably not going to be able to raise money or not raise money at very good rates, uh, in this environment. Um, and then another final thing is getting into the strategy. It's sort of how is the co company strategically positioned? So is it going to be able to pass on, uh, costs to its customers? Um, you know, how much, how much market power does it have? And that gets into sort of uh, the business strategy, uh, Porter, you know, uh, the five forces uh, type of thing. So um, th there isn't really an easy thing to look at, but it's sort of really digging into the fundamentals of the business, um, the underlying fundamentals of the business and uh, the company's uh, strategic positioning. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great start there, too. Thank you for that, Fadi. Yeah, great points, Bobby. And I've got three main points, and one that you Billy really touched on earlier around, you know, fund managers or institutional managers are the first sign of risk off, right? They're out. Doesn't matter what they're holding. Doesn't matter about the potential. They've got, you know, things, uh, certain objectives they, they need to meet outside of that stock. So they're out, which means, uh, which is why I personally don't like a lot of institutions on the register of a lot of the stocks I own. Because as you said, Bobby, a lot of them, were, if they're down 50%, um, it doesn't mean they're a dog, um, but it could just mean that they had a really bad register. Um, so if you have, if I just compare my my individual portfolio and not mentioning any names, the stocks that have performed the best during the during this uh, calendar year are the ones that had a high retailership. So these are people who don't run money for other people. Uh, they're running money for themselves. They don't have to answer to anyone else. They don't have to have certain cash levels. And if they believe in the stock, then they're happy to hold. So. Um, for me, my best performers this year are those kinds of stocks. My oh, oh real quick, because because it, cause it cut out for a quick second, so just want to clarify. You said the ones that have high retail ownership, right? Correct. Yeah, okay, the ones good. that have high retail. Ownership. It cut out for a quick second, is... so I wanted to make. Oh, sure. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's, really, that's really that's really interesting because it's counterintuitive too. It, it I, is, I, but retailers get to a point where they don't need to sell, and even if they're holding for the wrong reasons, maybe they're just holding out of hope, right? It still reduces the amount of upselling pressure right. on the stock where institutions don't care. They've got to sell. They'll sell at 10, 20, 30, 40% loss, whatever it is. If they're going to sell, they're going to sell, which adds a lot more selling pressure. But yeah, go on. No, no. You, I think there's just a stereotype of the retail investor being unsophisticated and, you know, trading and whatnot. But it's actually a lot of institutions that are forced sellers in a lot of, uh, a lot of circumstances, which I think is a really great point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the second point, Bobby, around why some of them are down this much and, and maybe on dogs is, you know, liquidity in the micro cap environment is very important. And I've seen stock, some of my own stocks, sometimes trading $2,000 a day and being down about $5 million in market cap. So just because someone needed to sell some money to get Christmas presents doesn't mean that the stock is actually worth $5 million less than it was yesterday. Um, so I think if you, it's very important to look at the register. Um, you know, how many of the top 20 shareholders, oh, sorry, how many of the, how many shares do the top 20 shareholders own? Um, who are those people? Have they had success in the past? Uh, it, it, do management, um, fall in, into that top 20 register? Hopefully in the top five. Um, so I think the register and liquidity in general is very important. And during market corrections, the liquidity is just completely taken out of the micro cap space. So a lot of these stocks can fall on very, very low volumes. Um, sometimes 50%. But the, the second we move out of this environment into a risk on environment, and hopefully that company has continued to kick goals, that they, they all go up just as fast on that small volume. So you've got to, you've got to find that balance between, I know it's dropped by X percent, um, but is that a fair reflection on um, the total register and what they're doing and the stock and what it's doing? So it, it, that's an important point. And I think the, the last point I want to raise was you need a strategy. Just because you have, you can look at a chart and see a company down 50% or 60 or 70, doesn't make it cheap. You've got to have a certain number of factors that you say, okay, for me to purchase a company, it's got to meet these five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 goals. Maybe not all of them, maybe 80% of them. And maybe the more goals it meets, the more allocation you give to it in your portfolio. But you can't just look at the price or the chart and say, you know, I've seen a lot of terrible charts that I've gone, to, that I haven't owned, but I've, I've bought in at stages where the company's down 90, 
And I'm sure at 30, 40, 50, 60, they're always up. Oh, Sheldon was saying, oh, I might double down. It's, very, it's really cheap here. So you've got to have a strategy that's uh, really personal to you. And there's nothing wrong with you using or tailoring your strategy to some other, you know, some other more publicly known people's strategies that share them online. Um, but you've got to tailor it to your own personality. Um, so if you're someone like me, you know, I have the patience of, you know, I don't even know what the analogy is, but I'm very, I'm a very patient person. I don't like um, action all day, every day, right? So I can't be a day trader. And uh, someone on the other side of the coin who is, you know, always wants action, loves the adrenaline, they can't be holding stocks like I do for two to three years. So you got to find a strategy that fits your kind of personality and then add factors that you're saying the company must meet these. And it's going to be different for everyone. There's, there's no, there's no perfect strategy out there. Whatever strategy works for you. If it, if it works, then do it. it. Doesn't have to work for anybody else, but you've got to have that strategy. And if you don't, then you're really going to be caught out and you're probably holding one of these stocks that are down 60, 70, 80% or probably all of your stocks are down by that much. If you were just buying in the hype of 2020, 2021, when you, when you should have been selling those stocks, you, you might have been buying them. Absolutely. Those are all fantastic points, Fadi, and, and both both that, both you and Billy gave here. So I, I hope everyone listening uh, had a pen and paper ready to go because I think at a bare minimum, all those points that they made right now are definitely things that you can think about when you're looking at potential companies to add to the portfolio or even just looking at your own current portfolio right now to see, you know, if they, you know, if you happen to be holding ones that are down, you know, 30, 40, 50 Hopefully not, you know, hopefully they're not down that much, you know, for those listening out there, you know, you, you've been able to avoid some of the pain uh, that we've all experienced. Um, but, you know, Fad, you you just gave your strategy there, of, you know, what you're doing in times like these. Billy, do you love to hear what your strategy is as well. It's pretty similar to Fadi's. Um, I, uh, I'm a very diet in the wool sort of uh, Buffett and Munger. Um, viewing stocks as uh businesses uh not as trading pieces of paper and um looking for uh, my our, strat our strategy I, as i define it is uh, special companies and special situations and usually when we buy a stock it's a little bit of both because you never want uh there's usually something unique about a company uh competitive advantage or uh, a great owner operator or something going for it. And then you want to buy with a significant margin of safety. It doesn't happen very often. Usually there's some sort of uh, special situation or a market downturn or the company going through a change or, or a turnaround um, that sort of enables you to get the, uh, the company at, at a significant margin of safety. Um, so, uh, we own both high quality compounders as well as sort of deep value uh, turnaround situations in allocations according to their risk. Um, and we are, uh, I am a long-term oriented uh, shareholder. So um, when we get in at a good price with a great company that we think is a great future, uh, we typically hold it for uh, over a year or at least. Um, I've had some companies in my portfolio for three or four years. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's pretty much, uh, the strategy. This has been a, a, a difficult year, but we've done, I've done a lot of moves now. Now we're, I'm looking at, uh, what stocks could have potentially the most upside coming out of this, um, this downturn. And uh, sort of rep repositioning from the defense. We have a mix of defense, what I would call defensive stocks, and then more aggressive. Um, so we're sort of slowly shifting into getting more aggressive as uh, uh, some more smaller cap stocks have gotten uh, beaten up. Absolutely. Hey, if you don't mind me following up right there with you, I mean, what? Without, I'm not asking you to name names here, but I mean, uh, are there certain sectors that have been particularly appealing to you that you feel? fit uh that more aggressive strategy i mean or or, or we, did you mention if, that in in your article the e-commerce and software stocks well that's definitely what i'm looking at now because they've been the most beaten up um i do have a predilection for uh, tech not 
unprofitable tech, but uh, I would say wide moat uh, uh, tech um, still gotten beaten up this year. Uh, it's it's not not the companies that are seventy to ninety percent down, but they're still twenty thirty percent down. I have a few that are up this year. Um, I also have a bit uh, in oil stocks. Um, it's it, it's a tech and oil heavy portfolio, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, certainly cloud and uh, uh, the infrastructure giants are some some uh, portfolio. Um, uh, kind of generals, kind of anchoring the portfolio, and then um, some tech, some some a uh, few consumer name, unique consumer name stories that are in there that I understand, um, and then and then the energy stocks, which uh, have obviously worked this year, and uh, I wish I had more of them, uh, but uh, again, I, I'm mo- most experienced. I'm most familiar with a lot of uh, tech, um, and so I, given that, um, you know, you don't have to be familiar with every single sector out there if you want to find unique stories. Um, I have two tech companies that are up this year. Um, not all. I mean, the rest, the whole, the portfolio is down. But you know, uh, I was giving the fist pump. Hey, I was giving the fist. But, hey, we'll take a win where we can take you, a win. It's just you think every tech set, every tech stock out there has got to be down this year, but um, there are still a few that uh, a couple that are actually up. So you can find um, unique situations and unique companies and unique stories in any sector, kind of in any market environment. Um, but uh, uh, given the long term nature of the holding and sort of what's going on. Um, with some of the innovation that's going on now and um and a lot of the sectors are consolidating uh which is making uh some of the players more profitable and more stable going forward um but th- those are the types of companies that i'm looking at and uh the company i'm going to pitch today i think is an emerging name uh that could become a big company one day but it's uh it's a small cap now Gotcha. Very good. It, the company you're talking about is the one that that's in the article as well. Uh, yes, okay. that's, that's not one of the ones that's, I, that this is a new, the one I'm talking to talk about is in, in the article, it's a new position and it's down a lot this year, but one I think has a lot of turnaround potential. Gotcha. Here, I'm going to come right back to you on that because, uh, from uh, Fadi, I want to also, you know, last time we, we actually, I, you weren't on the pod that long ago and, you know, we were talking about, you know, are you a contrarian? Okay, tough person. Why don't you check out some mining and psychedelics then, Miss? You know, <laughs> call yourself a contrarian. Let's go. You know, so uh, are those are those sectors? So I, I mean, cannabis was still hated at the time too. Now I think it's gotten a little momentum from some of the news that uh, uh, came out of the the, the Biden administration. Um, but I mean, are are those still sectors that you've been looking at actively, or there have been some other ones that have a few? Uh, potential turnarounds that you've been looking yeah. at? So I'm, I'm very much in the commodities space long-term. You know, th- there's no EV revolution without a huge amount of spending and capex and investment going into these small cap um, resource stocks. So I'm I'm pretty heavily uh, in, in that sector. I, on the, you know, if we, if we want to talk about the psychedelic space, the one company I do own is probably the one that, has gone down. It's it's down, and this is show just how hard it is, right? It's probably the stock I've got the most conviction in, but it's down fifty percent since the beginning of the year. Um, and if you and if you look at some of the reasons why, it's probably not that it's it's worth uh, you know, uh, it's dropped by fifty percent because they haven't met a certain goal. It was probably because it was just maybe overextended during the 2020, 2021 boom. But the fundamentals are just getting better and better even though the share price this year, and it's a biotech, right? So of course it's going to come down with the rest of the biotechs. Um, so t- for me, I'm very comfortable holding this stock, even though it's down 50%. I may be proven wrong, right? We may speak in six or 12 months and I say, that was a terrible decision. I should have sold that stock. The writing was on the wall. I don't know what the future is going to hold. But for me, the fundamentals just kept getting better and better. So, you know, why would I sell it? And we'll see. Famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's for sure. There you go. <laughs> All right, so so Fadi gave us his kind of favorite uh, uh, fallen angel right now, uh, or potential turnaround, excuse me, Fadi. Um, but uh, Billy, uh, what what what's your kind of favorite quote unquote fallen angel right now, in your opinion? 
Yeah. So, um, again, this is a stock I came to this summer, luckily, um, I think. Maybe not. Um, it's uh, a stock called uh, Farfetch. Um, it's actually based in London, um, run by a uh, founder CEO from Portugal named Jose Neves. And what I like about Farfetch, it, it you know, it's been thrown out with all of the other e-commerce stocks out there, but it has what looks to me to be better long-term unit economics, and it seems to be consolidating the um, luxury e-commerce world for itself. Um, and it sort of had this emerging, you know, e-commerce stocks benefit from network effects when they get to a certain escape velocity. Um, all the buyers are there. So all the sellers, you know, the sellers come on. So the buyers come there, the more buyers, the more valuable you are, the more sellers come onto the platform and it just feeds on itself. And it seems like, um, this company Farfetch has something that is sort of attracting um, the most premier brands in the luxury world uh, to its platform. And um, uh, luxury e-commerce is sort of running behind general e-commerce. Um, luxury brands are you know, often family owned. They have considerations sort of beyond this quarter's uh, revenue and earnings. So they've been very reluctant to sort of enter the e-commerce world. And this founder, um, Jose Neves, he seems to have mastered both the tech side in terms of uh, software engineering, really good. He's also a luxury uh, brand sort of aficionado um, himself. Um, so he actually he actually had a, a retail store in London that won uh, Luxury Retailer of the Year and uh, some some award in London back in 2006, and so he's able to sort of speak the language to these uh, family owned luxury brands that might be skeptical skeptical of e commerce, and um, uh, this year. Um, even as the company inked new partnerships with Salvatore Ferragamo, um, Neiman Marcus Group, um, Reebok, and just had a blockbuster um, deal announced with uh, Richemont, which is a Cartier parent. Um, nevertheless, the stock's gone from 50 to, I think it's about seven bucks now. Uh, I think it's all time high with 73. It's gone down to seven bucks. Um, the reason for that is I think uh, company had revenue growth of like 49% in 2020, 34% in 2021. Now it's going down to single digit growth this year. The reason for that is it's second and third largest markets are China and Russia. Uh, Russia has gone to zero. And China, because of the zero COVID um, stuff, you know, they're actually inspecting like every package that comes into the country. Uh, we're trying to, even though COVID can't be transmitted by through parcels, it's, it's, it's insane. So um, the, the China market's down, even though there's greater demand than this, the China market's got to be down, I think about 30% or something. Um, just due to their uh, self-induced recession and the zero COVID craziness. Um, even as the um, uh, Farfetch has inked the, all these new partnerships with these premier uh, brands, um, and I'll get to the Richemont. The Richemont one's the big one that was just announced uh, this summer. I'll get to that in a minute. So even though the business seems to be improving underneath the surface, uh, these one-time headwinds are, you know, causing a big slowdown in growth. Um, E-commerce stocks have been terrible everywhere. Some deservedly so. It, uh, this is a, you know, it, it, it trades in London. It's, it's London headquartered business, even though it trades in the U.S. So foreign currency has also been another headwind. Oh, and um, the uh, IDFA uh, demand marketing um, changes that Apple made. So that uh, all the social media 
uh, companies have less targeted ads is also raising costs uh, for the direct marketing. So just a tsunami, like four or five different huge headwinds hitting the business this year. Uh, they're still likely to have positive growth. They have slightly negative adjusted EBITDA, but not terrible. I think they had neg like negative $25 million or something of EBITDA last quarter. Um, they're taking this year to streamline costs in, in the business as well. And then next year, all they're going to be lapping all of those tailwinds. Um, they still have a very low penetration of overall um, uh, luxury, the overall luxury goods industry. Um, and even um, the, uh, the online luxury goods industry. Um, what's an interesting thing about this business model is that it's essentially three different businesses. Um, it's essentially like Amazon's third party um, business where they, they don't take position of, uh, possession of inventory except for a small amount of markdowns. So they're able to connect all of the, these luxury Maison stores uh, and get all that inventory onto the platform a very efficient third-party way. The second is they actually are kind of like the Shopify as well of the luxury industry in that they, uh, Farfetch is actually running the websites of these luxury brands direct-to-consumer websites. So they also get GMV that way. Third, Farfetch has actually bought some physical stores and actual brands itself. So it's not 100% pure play e-commerce. Um, it bought a um, luxury retailer called Browns uh, in London uh, back in 2015, I think, and it increased revenues 20-fold um, since taking over the business. It uh, bought a uh, platform for up and coming luxury brands called New Guards Group uh, in, I believe it was 2019. And uh, Farfetch has actually bought some of the brands under New Guards itself. Um, when it inks these, when it, it, its deal with Neiman Marcus is basically going to take Neiman Marcus uh, International. And Farfetch actually invested $200 million in Neiman Marcus as part of the deal. So not only does it have its current economics, but it also has these um, stakes in these sort of hidden assets as well underneath. Um, and it's pursuing a omni-channel vision called Luxury New Retail, which connects the online and offline world in a really interesting way. Um, and so it, it, it's a little bit complicated because it's not, you know, pure play e-commerce. It's got these hidden assets. It's in Europe. Things are moving all over the place. So that's why I think it's it's apt to be sort of mispriced by the market and just sort of thrown out with other um, e-commerce names. But uh, when you put it all together, it, there's, there's, there's a lot going for this company. And I'll, I'm going to finish up with the Richemont deal this summer. So this summer, so... Farfetch's main competitor was an older company called Ukes Netaporter, which was a luxury e-commerce website which operated on a wholesale model. They would actually buy wholesale, curate selection, and then sell to um, some older cu um, customers. That platform kind of was owned by Richemont. Uh, Richemont bought it a few years ago. It has kind of been struggling. Um, this summer, Richemont is selling 47.5% of the company to Farfetch and is taking a 10% stake in Farfetch as part of the deal. And all of Richemont's luxury brands are now going to be coming onto the Farfetch platform. And Farfetch is going to be running their, the, all of their, uh, uh, their websites as well. So that's Van Cleef and Arpels, Cartier, uh, Richemont has a, a whole really premier names in luxury goods. So uh, the, the deal is kind of interesting because it's um, Farfetch is owning 47.5%, um, a Middle Eastern uh, um, uh, investor is owning about 3%. Richemont's retaining the other 47%. It's an unprofitable. Um, entity right now, and Farfetch is going to basically absorb it and try to turn it around. 
and they have the option to buy the whole thing five years from now um, for a certain, it, it's a little bit of a complicated deal. They have the option to buy the whole thing in five years, basically. Right. So they don't have to consolidate it. Um, Farfetch gets to basically work its tech magic um, to turn this platform around. But the big thing is Richemont had the competitor. They're basically throwing in the cards and saying they can't compete, right? And they're, they're selling it off to... Uh, so when your biggest competitor basically sells themselves to you and then takes a stake in your company, it's probably a good sign that you have something going for it. Um, that deal won't close until next year, so it's not going to be in the immediate results. But it's just another... It's maybe the fourth deal they've announced... Fourth partnership they've announced this year. It just seems like there's a cascade of brands that are now gravitating towards um, what Farfetch has going and it seems to be consolidating it for itself. So I like the setup very much. The stock is trades at about one times revenue, about half of its 2021 GMV. And um, it just looks like a really good setup um, when looking beyond the next six months. Very good. And most obvious question you'll get today, are you still a shareholder in Farfetch? Yes. Very good. Cool. I actually bought more on Friday. <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah. So I was well, buddy for a sec. I, I was listening to Michael Gay yesterday and he, he was saying, you know, if the world is ending, you might as well be bullish because who cares if you lose money? <laughs> and if, Billy, if you look at the tailwinds um, for that comp for Farfetched, no China, no Russia, they're in Europe, which is in, you know, probably a massive recession at the moment. You know, what yeah. it can't get any worse. So you might as well be bullish. <laughs> what else could happen? That's that's what I'm saying. Like, what else could happen to this company? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it all ends, then who cares? But so you might as well be bullish. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, they just it's just this. I think the stock had a high of seventy three dollars, and now it's at seven. Um, yeah. it, it it went IPO in twenty eighteen at twenty dollars a share. Um, now it's at seven. Um, so and it's grown every year since then. So. That's it's funny. just uh, it's just a, seen an incredible sell off. It, it's a little bit weird, you know. It's a little bit off the radar for U.S. investors. I think it might fall through the cracks for a lot of people, and it's a little bit of a complex business. So it's a little bit complicated to tease through all the different parts of it because um, it's like part Amazon, part Shopify. Then it owns its own some of its own stores and its own brands. So it, it's like kind of like got a hodgepodge of uh, of assets there. Um, it has a JV in China with Rishimon and Alibaba. And it's interesting. Alibaba and uh, Rishimon invested in just the China JV with them, took a 25% stake at a $2 billion valuation, I think in 2020. And the entire stock is, I think, at a $2.8 billion valuation now. Wow. So... Um, obviously they bought at a <laughs> Alibaba and Richemont bought at uh, sort of the height of uh, probably when you shouldn't be investing in e-commerce companies, but still it's uh, it, so you're buying the entire stock now for about 800 million more than Alibaba and Richemont bought just the China JV. So. Yeah. And the market at the end of the day, probably he looks at China and Russia and says, Oh, we can't get involved in this. I think one of the advantages we have is if we have a high enough risk tolerance is we can make the move before the market. And so when let's just assume the world doesn't end and eventually things kind of go back to normal, then those two countries won't be an issue and the market might think, okay, I can, we can make a move now, which would probably mean it's going to be a much higher multiple than you paid. So I think that's an advantage we have as you know smaller, smaller investors. Absolutely. And also another thing I like is the luxury um, I think luxury is a little bit more recession resistant than uh, typical general sort of middle of the road commerce. Um, Have you seen Hermes L and all those stores at the moment? Hermes and, and LV <laughs> LVMH. Hermes and LVMH, I think, each reported like 20 something percent growth in the recent quarter yep. when the world was apparently ending. Um, you still can't so, get a Rolex watch or an AP watch or any of those things. So, different dynamics. Yeah. So, so, so Farfetch doesn't report until um, November. They're supposed to do an investor day before the end of the year. So um, I would definitely keep my eyes peeled on that. But um, it's really bizarre. They announced second quarter earnings in August and the Richemont deal. And the stock went to like 12 and a half 
and there's been no news since then. And now it's, it's, you know, it's just sold off with the market down to seven. Um, just, you know, unbelievable. It a really volatile stock since it's been in my portfolio. It's been like the most volatile name in my entire portfolio. So uh, it's just a, a good test of conviction. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's good if you're looking to build up a position, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it's still small position I'm looking to build up, but um, uh, I'm excited about this one. Uh, and I, I really do like the uh, the founder and CEO as well. If you listen to him on earnings calls, he's 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 uh, he seems like the real deal for sure. So okay, we're we're about there. So I wanted to close out and and thank thank you for you know getting getting into a little bit more about Farfetch and and, and yeah. uh, dating. I went on for a long time. I'm sorry. It's a, don't <laughs> worry. Man. It's all good. It's all good. If anything, it gave it, it gave uh, you know people uh, an example of the kind of work that you can and should probably be doing right now, um, mm -hmm. without question. Um, so my my final question for for both of you today, and again, thank you for contributing articles uh, on this theme for Planet Microcap Magazine. Um, the inevitable question is: are, are are there more potential fallen angels on the way, or or have we seen most most of them right now, or is there more coming? So, uh, Father, you want to want to start us off there? Yeah, uh, to me, the the real answer to that question is. It doesn't really matter because there's always going to be times where we have, you know, really bad corrections in the market. And there are always going to be times when we have big bull markets and everything in between. So I think everyone right now is being too pessimistic. I think there's a lot of amazing opportunities out there, um, especially in the micro cap space, because again, once liquidity exits, a lot of these companies are trading at such small valuations that the risk reward is really in your favor. Of course, you need a strategy to, to measure that for yourself. And I won't mention any stocks, but there's a lot of stocks now that, you know, you would have killed to buy at this level not too long ago. Um, so personally, I'm, I'm trying to look for opportunities to take advantage of at the moment. And the, the, the only other thing I'd say is, uh, and it might not seem like it now, but anyone who, who, join the market and there would be a lot of people anyone who joined the market in say 2020 made a lot of money likely lost it all this year um is don't like you're so lucky that you've gone through this period in the space of two years and i don't really feel like it but you know i joined right after the gfc you know just by chance um and so between you know 09 and say 15 there wasn't really much there wasn't really much uh volatility in the market so it took me a long time to actually go through quite a lot of the cycles and learn a lot of the things that you need to learn in order to then become, you know, have a high chance of becoming successful over the long term. You know, if you if you join in 2020, um, but in the last two years, you've gained a decade of experience in the market. And the worst thing you can do is just throw it in the bin because you lost some money. I lost a lot of money. I blew up my account twice. You know, everyone goes through it. You've just got to kind of Accept that it's part of the cycle. Be happy that you can go, you went through all of that in the space of a couple of years. Um, took me about 10. Um, and so just keep going. There's lots of great opportunities. Um, put a strategy together and, you know, you'll look, I'm sure in five years time or three years or whatever the time frame is, you'll look back and say, you know, it was a great time to enter and you learned so much during that period. That's, that's awesome right there. Um, Billy, close the out, man. Yeah. Are there more fallen angels on the way? There are always fallen angels on the way. Um, companies are always blowing up or running into difficulty and or entering the market or making acquisitions. Um, when you have market-wide downturn like this, it's almost like there are too many opportunities that you have capital for. Um, but that's what makes it exciting. Uh, like Fadi said, it, you know, Market-wide downturns, drawdowns are inevitable. Charlie Munger once said, if you can't handle your stock being down 50%, you shouldn't be in the market. Um, I assume a lot of people are getting being tested this year. But um, if you can just accept these bear markets as an inevitable part of investing, um, you can turn it to your advantage um, and try to become greedy when others are fearful provided you are in the right types of companies. And uh, hopefully you look at some of the characteristics that Fadi and I outlined today, and hopefully that can help guide you. That's a great place to end it.
Uh, gentlemen, where can everybody go and find more information about you as well as follow you on social media? Billy, uh, give us your website as well as, uh, I think you have a Twitter handle, right? Uh, I do. It's at, uh, at bdubs82 is my Twitter handle. Uh, I don't use so, that so much for uh, my, uh, my uh, investment, my, uh, my fund uh, investment advisory. That's uh, Stone Oak Capital LLC. Um, website is uh, stoneoakcapitalllc.com. I'm um, sorry, it's a long name. Got the LLC at the end there. So there's three L's in a row. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn, uh, Billy Duberstein, uh, where I post uh, my quarterly letters there. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Very good. Fadi? I kind of run everything through my Twitter handle. So if you follow me on Twitter at the Gladiator HC, because the Gladiator is my favorite movie of all time, um, you can find me there and kind of everything I'm doing under that handle. Very good, Billy Fadi. Thank you again, uh, and, and also this was really fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again for joining me on this to give a little, you know, a little even more perspective on what you wrote and uh, and Fallen Angels in general. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Take care. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast.